Hello folks, how's everybody doing out there? In this installment of the history of software in three letter acronyms, J is for JVM, the Java Virtual Machine, the story of what I think is one of the most influential design decisions in the history of software development. It starts here, Sun Microsystems in the early 1990s. Sun had put together a team nicknamed Project Green to develop a new programming language. Creating a new programming language is like starting a new political party. In theory, anybody can do it, and lots of people do. The comedy ones might get a bit of attention, and as somebody who invented a programming language based on Bon Jovi lyrics, trust me, I know, but to actually create a new programming language that becomes a serious mainstream contender, that is way harder than you might think. This is all happening at a point in history where object-oriented programming is getting a lot of attention, particularly because it was a fantastic programming model for building rich desktop applications with lots of widgets and buttons. But when it came to actually doing object-oriented development, developers had a choice. On one hand, there were multiple languages, mostly research languages originating in academia, that aspired to a pure object-oriented programming model. Simula, developed in Norway in the early 1960s, went on to inspire Smalltalk, which in turn would inspire Eiffel and the Common Lisp object system. Beautiful, elegant languages from a more civilized age that worked great as long as you had loads of memory, weren't too worried about performance, and you didn't want to do anything weird, like connect to a database, or run on Microsoft Windows, or hire developers to maintain your software. On the other hand, there was C++, a language that has been described as an octopus created by nailing legs onto a dog. Alan Kay, the inventor of Smalltalk, is quoted as having said, I invented the term object-oriented, and I can tell you that C++ was not what I had in mind. C++ is one of the world's most enduringly popular programming languages. It has been used to build everything from games to office suites to operating systems, and extending C, a famously minimalist language to support objects and classes, was no small feat of language design. C++ is fast, powerful, and flexible, but as anybody who's worked with it knows all too well, C++ makes it remarkably easy not just to shoot yourself in the foot, but to accidentally blow your entire leg off. When James Gosling and his team at Sun Microsystems set out to create the language that would become Java, their goal was to create an object-oriented language that was syntactically similar enough to C++ that developers would find it familiar, but which incorporated a decade's worth of innovation in language and compiler design, automatic memory management, garbage collection, threads, exceptions, and more. They named their prototype language Green Talk and then changed it to Oak after a large oak tree that stood outside Gosling's office window. Oak was designed to power a new generation of devices based around smart TVs, this being right at the point in history where it was clear that consumer-level digital networks were going to be a big deal, and although nobody was entirely sure how this was going to work, it was probably going to involve connecting your living room TV set to the internet via some sort of set-top box. This, of course, being back in the days when televisions were based on cathode ray tubes, and so the TV set actually had a big enough top that you could put a a box on it. Let's talk about platforms for a moment. Way back in the mainframe days, software was usually distributed as source code, because you'd probably have to tweak a few things to get it to build and run on your system. Then when microcomputers came along, it became common to distribute compiled binaries, but those binaries had to be built for a specific platform. A version of, say, Tetris, compiled for the IBM PC, wouldn't run on an Atari ST or an Archimedes. At the very least, you'd need to compile the program from source for each target platform, and more likely, to compile against different libraries for things like graphics and file system access, which varied between platforms. When you're building software that's expressly designed to deliver applications across a network, things get a little more complex. It wouldn't make any sense for a network server to maintain 10, 15, 20 different compiled versions of the same application to reflect the different kinds of set-top box that might connect to that server. And the solution that the Oak team came up with was neat. Oak programs wouldn't run on real hardware. They'd run on a virtual machine, a sort of idealized universal computer. That switched the onus from the software developers to the hardware developers. You want your set-top box to run the latest shiny internet applications? 
you'll need to write an Oak virtual machine for it. But then once you've done that, any program written in Oak will run on your device, in theory, without any modification whatsoever. I should take a moment here to point out that Java didn't invent the idea of a virtual machine. The preface to the original Java Virtual Machine specification, published in 1997, says that it is reasonably common to implement a programming language using a virtual machine. The best known virtual machine may be the P-code machine of UCSD Pascal. But I do believe Java was the first language to combine the portability of a virtual machine with the idea of delivering software across a network. Factor in the serendipitous timing of the dot-com boom, and it's easy to understand why 30 years later everybody's heard of Java and nobody's talking about UCSD Pascal anymore. Oak was renamed Java in 1994 when it turned out that Oak Technology, a US semiconductor manufacturer, owned a trademark on the name Oak. Around the same time, the cable TV industry lost interest in the project, and after a few days of brainstorming, the Java team decided to target the fledgling World Wide Web, gambling that the future of networked interactive media would be driven not by set-top boxes and cable television, but by desktop computers running web browsers. By 1996, Java was becoming a big deal. Mark Andreessen had announced that Netscape, the world's most popular web browser, would include Java support. And by the time I went to university in September 1997 to study computer science, Java was going to take over the world. Corel, still a credible competitor to Microsoft when it came to productivity applications, announced they were porting their entire WordPerfect Office suite and their flagship Corel Draw graphics software to Java. Java Swing and the Java native interface meant you'd be able to write your app once and run it on Windows, Linux, Solaris, macOS, and Java Beans, reusable software components, they'd make building software as easy as putting together Lego bricks. In fact, Java was such a big deal, it was going to make all other computers and programming languages obsolete, and soon we'd all be running Java on dedicated devices like the Java Station. Yeah, it's not quite how it turned out. Java did become one of the world's most successful programming languages. The latest Tyobi Index has Java as the world's fourth most popular language, behind Python, C++, and C. But the Java hysteria of the late 1990s collapsed along with the first dot-com bubble. Java eventually succumbed to the inevitable dichotomy of software platforms. Sooner or later, every project has to decide whether it's going to be exciting or it's going to be important. By the mid-2000s, the things in Java that turned out to be important, garbage collection, checked exceptions, threads, those weren't exciting anymore. And the things that used to be exciting, network computers, and Java beans and applets, office suites written in Java, yeah, they turned out not to be important. Not even important enough to invest the time and money in getting them right. More than that, though, the best way to destroy hype is credible success. Hype is about excitement. It's about the tantalizing possibility that if you jump on board at just the right time, you'll become part of something unprecedented and maybe end up rich and famous along the way. And in the late 90s and early 2000s, a lot of people did exactly that. And yes, many of them used Java, and a fair few of those got rich and famous by getting in right at the beginning and getting out before anybody realized their idea wasn't going to work. But by the mid-2000s, Java was being used in business and industry all over the world, not to build applets or to run Corel Draw on set-top boxes, but to create stable, reliable, boring software. Java became the language of choice for things like calculating insurance premiums and booking railway tickets. And friends, nothing is ever going to be exciting to startups and undergraduates if people in suits are already using it to write pension management software. But the decision to run Java on a virtual machine, that turned out to be one of the most significant design decisions in software history. Decoupling software from the hardware it runs on has been one of the most significant objectives of the last 50 years of personal computing. Whether that's Microsoft Windows device driver model, which means the people who write your word processor don't need to know or care what kind of printer you're using, or the Rosetta virtualization software that allowed Apple to switch from PowerPC processors to Intel in 2005, and then switch again to Apple Silicon 20 years later, or the data centers full of virtual machines that would become known as the cloud. I still dream of a world where Microsoft Office 97 was toppled from its throne by a cross-platform WordPerfect Office suite running on Java, but yeah, this ain't that timeline. A decade after its release, Java was largely relegated to servers, data centers, and corporate intranets. When it came to client-side web applications, 
web developers vastly favored dynamic HTML and proprietary plugins like Macromedia Flash. When it came to the desktop, the Windows folks had C Sharp and .NET WinForms, the Apple folks had Objective-C and Xcode, and the Linux folks, they already had half a dozen different window managers, widget libraries, languages, and UI frameworks to choose from. But it turns out all the folks trying to predict the future of desktop computing, they were looking in the wrong place. The Java dream, code that you could write once and run anywhere, has come true in ways nobody could have dreamed of back in the 1990s. Because today, Java code is running quite literally everywhere. There's Java running on planes, cars, trains, on top of mountains, under the sea, and in outer space, not to mention in every bar and coffee shop on this planet. Because there are something like 3 billion active Android devices out there right now. And it turns out, when you're building apps for hundreds, maybe thousands of different devices and handsets and tablets from dozens of manufacturers, writing your apps in Java and running them on a virtual machine, that's a pretty good way to do it. Folks, I hope you found that interesting. As you probably noticed, it's been a little while since the last installment of this series, because I have been working flat out creating my first video course for Dome Train. And you bet I'm going to take a moment to plug it, because if all you folks bought it, I could spend the next six months making fun videos about computer history. It's about email, specifically all the things I've learned about email over 25 years of building applications that send mail, and how to use those things in .NET applications. How does SMTP actually work? What do you need to know about DNS to make sure emails from your platform don't end up in junk mail? What is SPF and DKIM and DMARC? I show you how to use libraries like MailKit, MindKit, how to use MailJets, markup language, MJML, to avoid the horrors of coding HTML email by hand, and how to build a mail rendering pipeline that combines MJML and Razor to create beautiful, responsive, personalized emails. And I show you how to use channels, threads, background workers, and microservices to do all of that at scale without slowing down the rest of your application. The course is called Sending Email in .NET, From Zero to Hero. It's out now on dometrain.com. Lifetime access is £155.99, but if you buy it before the end of April, use the code BIRTHDAY2 to get 40% off, or just click the link in the video description. In the next installment of the history of software in three-letter acronyms, K is for K. Yes, I know, that's not a three-letter acronym. My series, my rules. And if you want to know what the K in K stands for, well, that's complicated. Better tune in and find out. Until then, you'll take it easy out there, look after each other, and I'll catch you next time. Bye-bye.